say he had this on with work or something like that. Okay, that's cool. It's good to be here, though. I'm, it's great I'm, to be here. Yo, I'm upset. with y'all, man. I'm upset I missed Sunday's show, but yeah, man, that's what we got to do. Hey, look, it's from the logo. I am your host, ZZ Mother Huncho, and that's my boy Gifted Hoops, and that's my boy Double Holic, and we in the building. You feel me? We're missing a couple members. They'll be here in the short. Don't trip. Y'all saw the title of the show, so let me just say, if y'all were wondering who picked the title, who picked the thumbnail, that was me. That was that, that was, was you. That was me. Um, because Tori Eason is is literally MVP for the Golden State Warriors, and he don't even play for the team. <laughs> you want to know why? Because bro decided to open up that mouth, started getting it, started getting the yapping online, testing mm-hmm. Warriors. Warriors come out to play, and the Rockets haven't won a game since. So <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't know how the hell else to put it. But damn, that just that just sucks. But we'll get into that later on. The gifted, tell the people how you feeling, bro. Feeling pretty good, man. Um, I just got off of uh, work. Big game tonight with Warriors Lakers. I can't wait to. Bro. Watch that. That's a huge game in the Western Conference. And more importantly, we're getting closer and closer to the playoffs. We're finally getting a chance to see playoff basketball. The playing is going to be absolutely outstanding in the Western Conference. Carl Anthony Towns is apparently going to be playing the tail end of his regular season games. So Minnesota gets to go into the playoffs knowing that they have cats. So overall, a lot of good things in the NBA. A lot of big games still that have to be played down the stretch. So I'm excited, man. Truly. I'm feeling good. <sighs> yeah, the, the postseason is going to be one of the greatest postseasons like, of recent memory, so I'm very excited. There's going to so. be a lot of names that's going to be made and a year where people are finishing their story, when a year when people are breaking records and breaking charts, you know, in a year where people are fulfilling their prophecies, right? Shout out to the WWE, yes, Cody Rhodes. Yes, you feel me? But in the year when that happens, bro, this this postseason that's coming is going to be exciting. This spring is going to be fire. A lot of people are really going to make their names in this postseason. We can see if Jokic can sit here and solidify himself amongst the greats. We can see if Luka can finally enter the conversation of greats. We can finally see if LeBron – nah, I don't want to talk about the Lakers. But if Kevin Durant can save his legacy. Like, there's a lot of people in the playoffs right now that really can make a name for themselves. And I'm very, very, very excited about what's going to go on. You feel me? Um but before we get into that, and I'm sorry to call an audible here, ZZ, Uh-oh. but I did want to comment on the Bronny thing. And I, that's, I was very upset that I missed it because I did. For the people that think LeBron is ruining like Bronny's chances, I, I need y'all to understand something. Do you know how hard it is to be an NBA player? Do you know what percentage of chance you have to be that good? To be an NBA player, slim to none. If Bronny's not living up to that, it has nothing to do with LeBron James other than the pure and simple fact he's just not good enough. And it's okay. That's why when people try to sit here, compare kids to their fathers who's NBA players. More times than not, it's not going to be work the same. You want to know why? Because the fact that their father made it to the NBA is ridiculous. It's a crazy slim chance. So, to me, at least, trying to say that if you are, I don't know if you guys are, but if you are one of the people that think that Bronny's messing up, I mean, LeBron is messing it up for Bronny, no. He's just not good enough. Simple. That's all I had to say about that. Uh, but according to Skip Bayless, he would be able to, if he were drafted tomorrow, he'd be able to play NBA level defense. So that was to Skip Bayless. <laughs> I think he, of all I, think, I think the best part of his game is defense, mm-hmm. NBA yeah. level defense. I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that, buddy. Look, but even then, you're not going to be a reliable shooter for your crew. Mm, I don't even know how much PT you're going to get, sir. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And my thing is, is uh, like to, to what Dub alluded to, it's hard being an NBA player, but it's almost even harder to be an NBA player's son because at the end of the day, especially if you are, you know, Michael Jordan's sons, we saw how their basketball careers ended or played out. 
uh, or LeBron's son, the media attention, the pressure to be just like your dad, if not maybe better, or all, like all of that stuff's going to play in your head. At the end of the day, though, when you look at Bronny James and you're looking at it objectively, he's not that good. Like he's not he's not as good. He's not nearly as good, or nearly has had the hype that his dad had when he was his age. Like you know, it's or when LeBron was about to get drafted. You know what I'm saying? So at the end of the day, like you have to just accept the facts for what it is. Like I've said it before. I think that Bryce is the better player. Genuinely. I think mm-hmm. that he has a better shot of actually making more noise than Bronny is in terms of just like when you look at him as an all around player, like, so, and he doesn't, and he isn't getting nearly as much of the media attention that Bronny got even at when he was Bryce's age. So it's just like, there's a lot of pressure that comes with it at the end of the day, but you have to keep it a buck. Like bro's not that good. You know, if he's going to declare for the draft, all the power to you, you know, if LeBron's about to pull some Hulk Hogan politics or some shit and end up, you know, getting a, getting a chance to play with the son. Cool. It's all a part of our precious King story, right. Or Jalen's baby daddy story. Like it's all a part of it. Like, yeah, what it is. But anyway, let's move forward. Let's move forward. So the first thing I wanted to talk about, first of all, was just kind of looking over tonight's games. When you look at the head to head matchups, at least the two marquee ones, they're pretty good. You got uh, the Milwaukee Bucks and the Boston Celtics. The Boston Celtics, who are 15 games ahead of Milwaukee, which is insanity. And you look at the one through 10 seed in the Western Conference, and, and bro, the West is crazy. It always has been. So I'm going to get y'all's thoughts on that for a second. Because I want to say this. I, I will say I saw earlier it was a clip of Nate Robinson, and he said that he does – basically, he said that the Celtics don't have that it factor. He doesn't feel like they're going to do anything in the postseason. It's going to be the same old story. They just don't have that it factor that he knows a championship team you can just see, like the Denver Nuggets and the Warriors when they won. You know, just he doesn't think that. So I want to get y'all's thoughts on that. Do you think that this is the Celtics year, or do you think they're going to come up short again? Well, A, um, in terms of it factor, I'm pretty sure he just means best player. I mean, normally when you think of the it factor for a team, it's some type of, of like crazy avalanche or some player who can just break the game and really carry your team. So I think he's really saying like there's nothing that aggressively stands out that really moves me like these other yeah. teams because – I don't believe that they have the best player going into different types of playoff series. In terms of a team aspect, though, they they as a team are supposed to be the it factor. You know, like they yeah. they are like the third, I believe, uh, all time net rating, which is kind of crazy for any regular season team. They've been that dominant, and I think that dominance will continue on into the playoffs. I really don't don't think the Eastern Conference has any answers for the Celtics. I think there's some teams that, you know, sure we can say okay, the Heat, sure, like. Maybe that's possible, but their fourth quarter stuff has been tough. Also, Duck and Robinson getting hurt is looking rough, you know. But I still think that in terms of them being able to succeed, I think they should go to the finals. To me, that's my finals lock. I just am very confident in them going to, to the finals. But in terms of them winning, I mean, hey, they're a great team, but so yeah. is Denver. And I feel like in both of those Denver matchups, what I've learned is Boston doesn't know how to get out of their own way sometimes, where Tatum struggled both games. Jalen Brown had terrific games. But down the stretch, it came down to who is generating better shots. And Tatum couldn't really get his shot going. Um, they would sometimes have Chris S. Porzingis catching the ball near the nail closest to the three-point line compared to, like, you know, being directly in the paint. And they were allowing him to just self-create, which he can make those shots, sure, but they were tough contested shots. It felt like Boston didn't really have a good rhythm offensively. Defensively, they played very good defense on Denver. But if you're not matching what Denver can do offensively, at a certain point, Denver is going to get the shots that they want and they're going to beat you. And I Mm -hmm. think in the finals this year, if they meet up, I think it's going to be that type of game plan where Denver is able to beat them. But I think Boston has the chance to prove me wrong. Not when you have a Joel Embiid stopper like Al Horford, man. (laughs) <laughs> and he's going up against Jokic, where, let's be real, offensively, even though Jokic is a better passer, in terms of scoring, the fact that or- Al Horford's able to contain Embiid is telling to his ability that maybe he could sit here and do something to Jokic, right? But let me not troll. Let me not troll here, right? <laughs> okay, wait. <laughs> <laughs> let me not troll here. Um, 
so the Celtics, I've been bipolar with all year. Not even going to hold you. I've been bipolar as hell with them. But in an Eastern Conference, we're legit every single team. It's just up and down and terrible. They've shown moments of being good. They've shown moments of being bad. Injuries are a part of the equation, right? To me, the Boston Celtics, there's no excuse for them not to make it out the East. There's no excuse. None. Agreed. And Agreed. even in my, I'm not going to lie, I'm not believing in the Miami run again. But if they lose to Miami this year, fire the whole team. Not even <laughs> hold them. It's it crazy bad at that me. point. Yeah. It's just, that's wild to yeah. me. You're losing to them, what, two times in a row? And they're what? They're probably going to be a plan. Yeah, let's get the hell out of here with that nonsense, right? So the Boston Celtics in the East, Milwaukee is questionable. Don't know what the hell they're going to bring. Not that great on the road. Defense has been suspect all year. Dame has been up and down. The main consistent guy has really been Giannis for them offensively. But even then, that running dunk stuff ain't moving me. So to me, Boston Celtics is the clear team that's going to make it out the Eastern Conference. I don't see anybody else. What? I know. I like that. I'm sorry. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but yeah, there's not other team. The Knicks was kind of like my sleeper team, but they're going through injuries right now. OG seems like he's not going to be able to play, so that's a big loss for them in my mind. So it really looks like the Boston Celtics should have a clear way to the finals. And then once they're at the finals, I mean, they only got to beat one more tough team, and that's it. And could do you see them folding like they did in 2022? Maybe I can understand that. But when you've acquired Drew, you've acquired KP, I think that team just has way too much balance on their crew to be losing to anybody, you know? So even against the Nuggets, I said last year, the Nuggets was a team that could really give – uh the Celtics are a team that can really give the Nuggets issues, especially yeah. with their ability to yeah, stretch possible. the floor out, especially with KP's ability to have length on the side be a, a rim protecting shot blocker and then maybe give Jokic a bit of problems. Now Jokic is going to get his, but his length alone is something that could really help him out in terms of playing defense on uh Jokic. And on top of that, even Al Horford, Al Horford is a guy that could, you could put on him in some staggered lineups where he could get a uh, mix, making some issues for uh Jokic as well. And their ability to stretch the pain out KP's ability to destroy one-on-one -on -one matchups. I mean, I'm not going to lie, especially against the Denver Nuggets. I'm still of the belief that, the Celtics is the best team suited to defeat them. And See, if they're not, and but if they're not able to, like you said, get out of their own head, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's when it's really gonna draw a lot of criticism for these guys, you know. That's that's exactly what I was about to say. Was the only team that can stop the Celtics from from doing what they should be able to do, which is at the very least make the finals and at the very most win that shit. Is themselves. The only people that are stopping them from doing that is themselves. Because I look at the Celtics and I'm like, yo, they have, I think, the best defensive backcourt in the league, right? On top of the fact that you have Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown, that's a top five duo in the league, arguably, right? Christoph Porzingis, like you said, was an X factor for this team when they picked them up. I was like, yo, this guy is literally going to be able to do exactly what Dub just said, you know being able to attack one-on-one -on -one matchups, being able to shoot, pick and fade options, all of that. If there's a three-point avalanche and Kristaps Porzingis has an opportunity to be a part of it, that's making for a very scary-ass team, at least on the offensive end, right? So in terms of teams that stand in their way of winning the championship, as far as that goes, it better not be Miami. I'm with you, Dub. If it's Miami again, blow the whole shit up. It don't, it's not even... It ain't even a topic of discussion. If you can't even get past the team that that can't even make it into the playoffs without the play-in, nah, bro, this whole experiment is worthless. I don't know what it is, but somebody got to yeah. get fired. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But if that would that would be something that I think at this point, if it if it did happen again, I will say I would be surprised because it's like either Jimmy got the secret sauce or y'all just suck. Like <laughs> there's there's something wrong there. In terms of all the other teams, though, Milwaukee is shaky as hell. We've already been over that. The Knicks have injury issues in terms of Julius Randle being gone for the rest of the season. It's going to be up to Jalen Brunson in a carry job. I don't really know. They have great. They have other great vital pieces that might help them stay. That are going to help them probably stay afloat. Obviously, within the last six games or whatever. But in a, in the postseason, it's going to be Jalen Brunson heroics until you get beat. 
and that's it. And I don't see them making it probably to the conference finals. The Magic, cute little three seed, nah. I don't I don't think they're knocking out the Celtics. So when I'm going down the list, I'm just like, yo, I don't There's really not the many teams that can do it, honestly. Yeah. And then and then so that would lead me to believe your only your path is straight to the finals. Now, whoever ends up across the way, if it's the Nuggets in a seven game series, we saw it and we saw a small sample size this year. But I'm I'm kind of in agreement with Dub on the fact that I think that the Celtics will just have a whole different mindset as a whole going in, namely Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown. Right. All year long, we've seen them do some pretty great things and have, you know, good moments here and there. But. All that matters is what you do in the finals with this team that should make the finals, right? So at the end of the day, it's just it, we're going to have to see. we just going to have to see, but it should be Boston in the finals at the very least, bro. Very least. What y'all looking up? What if y'all look like y'all looking up something? I'm looking up teams to – I'm looking up uh, teams that have won over 62-plus games and even teams that I'm going to wait till the end of the year and teams to okay. have uh, won 65-plus games. And how many of those teams won the actual championship, right? I remember mm-hmm. the Mavericks. Um, had 2007. A, 2007, they had a crazy loss in the Six. postseason. Uh, that was right. the We Believe Warriors, yeah. Yeah, they yeah. Were so that was 15, I want to yeah, say. That, yeah, that was wild, right? So, yeah. I'm about like, like I said, if the Celtics are this good of a team, you're above 62 wins. And you don't win a chip, and I'm trying to see the class of uh, teams as a part of that category. You're crazy. <laughs> Not gonna so lie, you're wild. Me. Because when you and then when you look, when you factor in everyone else, like bro, the Celtics have sixty. They're sixty-two and sixteen, right? They are the only team in the conference that's above fifty wins, right? Like, that, like mm-hmm. that's insane. That you you should be able to. Walk right through the Eastern Conference, right? The West you would is think, insane. Yeah. And so West has always been insane. Think back to like 2015 when the Warriors won 67 games. I think the 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 one through the six seed in the Western Conference, everybody had 55 wins or more, right? It was a crazy time. It was a crazy, just a crazy time. Mm-hmm. The West has always been the superior conference, but the Celtics look like the superior team to everyone else. So. This is crazy. So I'm looking at it since 1999 and 2000. Yeah. All of the 60 win teams. And this is why I say they may be cursed because the amount of 60 team wins, 60 win teams that have lost since the year 1999 and 2000 are one, two, three, four, five, oh. six, seven, eight, nine teams and only one. Only one, two, <laughs> three. <laughs> Only three teams won the chip. So it's not looking good for them. Wait, three so out of the last 360 win teams won, won the title in the last how many years? Basically 25 years. 25 years. Oh my God. Wow. 20, 24 to 25 years. Yeah. So three out of the last 12 teams to win above 60 wins have actually won a, cha- a, a championship, which is actually disgusting. That is not a good side of history to be on. Mm-hmm. And not. Nah. God bless, you know? Damn. Damn. So, I mean, do we have any any way to check, like, oh, you know the what? actual degree? You know what? Because what? What's up? That article was written in 2009 because I knew they were missing something. Oh, 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 they nine. missed, they missed they missed the Miami Heat war, the Miami Heat team that I know won sixty wins, and the then Warriors. the uh, the Warriors that won sixty wins as well. So let me don't take my word for it. That was that article was written in two thousand nine. That's my mistake. Damn, interesting. L dub. All right, oh, let's move forward. Uh, so so tonight we have a team in the in the Milwaukee Bucks. How important is this game for the Milwaukee Bucks? Not for the Celtics, but for the Bucks. Yo, I mean, they got to win something. They gotta win something. Drop it. Like they gotta win something. Back to to two below five hundred teams is crazy. But now you gotta go up against the best team in your conference. This could be a preview of maybe a conference finals, or you know who knows. Me, me personally, bro, is like it's like this, right? Why, why should it be important to them? Because to me, it's like. Let's say if you lose this game, I just need y'all to perform well. 
I need y'all to perform well and actually string along things together. Now, if you're on the losing end of that, let's not forget, I, I'm going to compare football, but the Giants lost the New England Patriots back in uh, 2007, I believe. Mm -hmm. But they were able to find continuity and were able to string along uh, amount of games to beat them in the postseason. Yeah. So Milwaukee, I think the most important thing for them isn't really about winning and losing. It really should be about continuity, finding rhythm and understanding these guys so that you can beat them and where you could take the loss today. But as long as you understand and get a deep look at this team that you can sit here and take that to the postseason and defeat them. You feel me? Mm -hmm. So I think that's the most important thing with the Milwaukee Bucks, but not even just for this game, for every single game that they're a part of, like they need this. They need this so much yeah. right now because if not, Bro, I, I don't see them winning. I don't yeah. see them winning at all, you know? Go ahead. I like what Dub said. I think what Dub said is 100% spot on because how many games Dub, have we seen this year where before they fired their coach, they won a lot of games, but their process was so terrible, but they would wind out squeezing out wins. To mm -hmm. me, it's about how they play, not, not necessarily winning or losing, even though obviously that does matter, but their process. Because I guarantee you tonight, bro, Bro, if they wind up squeezing the game out narrowly off of game shooting or, or, or Giannis dominance, but they're not in, like, actual control of the game, they're not really getting good quality looks, and we don't see, like, their defense really showing life, that's a bad sign to me. But honestly, I don't know what they do to improve that because they had the whole season to do that. There's, like, four to five games left now. I kind of think they are who we've seen them to be. Um I think that the variance of Dame in the clutch is a big thing for them. But me, the only thing that I care about is defensively, can they look even comparable? Because I'm telling you, man, that that, that Malik Beasley Dame stuff looks bad in the regular so season. Bad. I so cannot bad. imagine the playoffs when they're hunting that. Yeah, they're hunting that. that. And they need Beasley too because they don't really have shooting old mm -hmm. DLD like that. So they need him, which, which is tough to say in 2024 that a team needs Malik Beasley. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah, that is wild. Yeah. Oh my god. All right, let's 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 go into uh to some other games we got slated for tonight. Hey, so. I'm looking and for chat, just to let y'all yeah. know, I'm looking into this 60 win team right now. Thank God. Yeah, love it. I don't have the exact numbers, but it is looking <laughs> really sick for teams to win 60 60 wins and not win the title. 2011. I know the the 2011. No, not 2011, but um. Yeah, yeah, 2010, 2011. There was two 61 teams in that year. The Bulls Rose. and the Spurs. The Bulls and the Spurs. Go Rose. And then Dallas Mavericks. But the Dallas Mavericks won the chip that year. Yeah. The Cleveland Cavaliers in 2010 won 60 wins. Didn't win the chip that year. So it's like, it's not. Now we, we remember the 2013 Miami Heat. They sat here and won. The Spurs in 2014, they won with 60 yep. wins. In 2015, though, Golden State Warriors, they won. 2016, though, Cleveland only won 57 games. The Spurs and the Warriors won 67 73. They lost, mm -hmm. you know. So, this is um, in 2018, Houston Rockets 65 wins. Yeah, they lost. Mm -hmm. Remember the Milwaukee Bucks 2019? They lost. So, mm -hmm. it's not it's not good for that. I promise you, they're losing more time than winning, and that is a glaring, that is a crazy uh superstition right there. <laughs> I'm really curious what what this same record would be in terms of net rating for each team that won. Because again, like their overall net rating is some historical shit that we've never seen before. I feel like all the teams that have won have had like a high net rate. At least you you have to have one to win because that means like you're balanced on both ends. I yeah. would imagine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I'm not into those advanced stats, bro. Like, what the hell is wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> my bad, talking my about bad, net, my bad. Talking about, talking about net rating. I'm like, yo, gifted. Like, what the hell? <laughs> I, don't look, I don't look for no common denominators in terms of net rating and who's winning the chip. My God. I feel that. I feel that. <laughs> but W, but W uh, question, though. I think we need some nerds to look that up, bro. If you're a nerd in here, give a like up in the video. Appreciate all y'all, bro. We all know. Hey, who that joint? Closet, you feel me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Figure it out for us, please. Oh my god. 
All right, so the next matchup of the night that's, I guess, worth talking about is the Los Angeles Clippers and Dub's favorite West Coast team, the Phoenix Suns. So big game, actually. That game that is, is a big huge game. If you think about it, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. We got a we got a Clippers team that's fifty and twenty eight on a three game winning streak, uh, and a Suns team that's forty six and thirty two, battling to stay above that spot of the play in speed at, at at the seven seed, which the Pelicans occupy, which is crazy. Um, so tonight, what are we thinking? Who we got? Clippers or Suns? Well, I need the Clippers to win so the Suns can fall further and we can potentially move up, even though we probably can't move up that high. The games are so close. It's like if the Suns wind up losing out, they could drop further into the play-in. So yeah. it's possible, even though it's not all likely. Um, but in terms of who wins, I mean, right now the Clippers have no Kawhi Leonard. Paul George Spaz, he just had 21 points versus – the Cavs the other day. So, I mean, yeah. James Harden, I don't think he's clear to play. He wasn't as shoot around, so he also might not play. If Harden doesn't play, I really think they don't Mm -hmm. beat them, honestly. I know the Pelicans also not healthy, just beat the Suns, but I think for the Clippers, not having Harden or Kawhi or Paul George is a lot. Yeah. It's a lot. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, I think also like the Clippers would, because I think the four or five seed, the winner of those, right? Yeah. In that yeah. series, they face the two and seven seed, right? The winner uh, of that. The basic. So in my mind, I mean, even though I don't understand why they would do like want to go up against the Nuggets, or maybe they're hoping the Timberwolves or OKC is going to get in that second spot over the Nuggets, but. Maybe the Clippers are sitting here trying to avoid the Suns and you know in the second round, you know. So that's my thing. So maybe you know, resting Kawhi, you know, they're four games ahead of them, so they're not really gonna lose that four to five spot right there. So right. and there's only four games left in the season. So to me, I mean, we don't really need to take this game that serious. Allow the Suns to sit here, keep keep that six seed, so that you know that way you can have an easier <laughs> you can have an easier road to the chip. Uh, you don't have to keep going against juggernauts, and maybe that those guys besides the Nuggets, uh, the Timberwolves or OKC will get that two seed, and then you'll probably get some more favorable matchups in the second round. That's the way I look at it. Rather than you know you beat them in these next two games, and then you have to you know face the winner of Denver or uh phoenix suns and you know i'm not i'm not feeling that you feel me so that's how i i think that's kind of what they're doing and they're notorious for that of just ducking teams in the postseason and taking away uh uh, resting players so they can have a specific seating so if they do do that with james harden and Kawhi not playing and even if they rest some more guys in the next game i think that's more of what they're doing and the Suns should be able to close the deal, and the Suns should be able to sit here and get those dubs right there. I think the Clippers are probably going to be giving to them. You feel me? Yeah. I'm not going to lie. Dub think he's slick. I'm going to be very clear. If the Clippers are doing what Dub is saying, then they're definitely not winning any title because I'll be so real with you. <laughs> Trying to manipulate the standings with the West where it changes every single day, game to game to game, mm-hmm. is probably the dumbest thing they could do. <laughs> honestly like like i like you will mess around and and, and be six or even lower doing but something no, like that in the western conference no wait no because bro like they only have four they only have four games left right they got the sun uh-huh. the sun's in back to back then they got the jazz and the rockets like they're chilling and the the dallas dallas mavericks the only thing clippers have to do is not lose three games as long as they don't lose three games you make that true. sound so easy it's when true. we know right now Kawhi is not playing we know uh harden has some injury stuff that's going towards the playoffs the only guys they really have would be paul george and russ and i'm just saying we know how bad the defense has been post all-star break but i wouldn't be surprised bro, they could I'm, lose out I'm trying to tell you, man. I don't <laughs> think those guys are hurt. I think they just chilling. I swear. I think they just chilling. You know, they chilling as bad though. No, I, I agree. I agree. We talked about the mentality of the Clippers, and I don't disagree with that point, right? Yeah. But I wholeheartedly believe that like Kawhi, we're gonna get you rested for the postseason. We're just gonna be like your knees acting up. James Harden, you get hurt a bit. We're resting you up. You know, we'll just let this rock. We're not going to lose this seeding anyway unless we really severely underperform. 
we straight. We good. Houston Rockets out eliminated, so they're not really going to try in that last game either. We just got to close one of those games out versus the Rockets and the Jazz. So, in my mind, Clippers really have nothing to lose if they sit here just, you know, helping the Phoenix Suns out, in my yeah. mind. But I do agree with you to the point where that is a bad look for your uh, crew and your organization. Yeah, I'm saying. But, so, but like, it's, it's that, but also, like, Playing those games around in the West, like I understand Kawhi because if he's hurt, you're cooked regardless. You need him to be healthy. That should be priority number one. So if they're doing that for him, sure. But in terms of like trying to lose games on purpose for seeding, bro, that ain't it. But they've done it before, bro. And what? Yes. And what did he get? Yes. And that's what I'm saying. So, uh, yeah, you're I agree. right. <laughs> they're losers. They're losers. <laughs> you know? uh, that's what the Clippers they're are. They're the Lakers' little brother, right? Maybe little cousin. Maybe not even that. Maybe little sister, right? But nah, little the, sister is crazy. <laughs> but <laughs> shout out to shout out to my women out there. Yes, sir. Let's go, sister. Let's go. But oh but <laughs> what's it called? Um, I, I I think I think that's really what they're doing, bro. I'm not gonna lie. Like I really wholeheartedly believe that. It's and not crazy. I no. swear they are, and it's. Uh, it's funny. I loved watching it every year just for them to lose. Like, just who are they? Who are they? They gonna, hate. They're they hate. Not gonna, they might not even beat the Mavericks. I'm not going to lie. Now they can lose to the Mavericks. Yeah. That, that's, that's possible. I cannot wait for that series right there. A little rematch with Luca. He finally got a squad. Oh boy, that's a Kyrie Irving legacy game for me. Oh, oh my shit. God. I'm so <laughs> and they got Gafford and Lively down there to abuse them down there. And they got some more size with PJ. Yeah. Pack it up, baby. Clippers going home, man. Clippers going home, bro. First round. First round exits, I promise you. Bro, look, so all I'm going to say on this matchup is, yeah, it's really not that important in terms of these – for these teams. I think the Suns should get it done. But I've seen them lose to teams that they shouldn't have lost to a few times this season, more than a few. So it is what it is, but um, they should win tonight. The main event, on TNT at least, the Golden State Warriors Big game versus tonight, the man. Los Angeles Lakers. LeBronson Johnson versus Steph Curry again. So, Gifted, I was just looking at the playing spots, right? First of all, mm -hmm. chat, chat, if you haven't liked this video, like this video right now. Um, lock in. Lock in right now. Secondly, chat, Warriors, Lakers, who you got tonight? Just just drop the team in there. Gifted. I was looking at the play-in spot earlier, and I started to think to myself, I was like, yo, the Warriors could, could smoke any of these niggas in a play-in game. Like, like, bro, what? The Lakers are the one team that I'm worried about for sure, of course. But the Kings, the Pelicans, the Warriors can't win that? What? Like, like, what are we talking about? I was looking at I was like, the Warriors' chances of actually making it into the playoffs are great, like, for what it's worth. Like, they're the greatest 10 seed of all time. Oh, God, don't do this shit. I've been over this. We've been over this, <laughs> I, bro. I hate when teams do that, man. Oh, yeah, they're the greatest eight seed of all time, and they has got popped to all hell by the Lakers in the bubble. Oh, poor <laughs> They're the greatest eight. Like, like listen – can they beat these teams hypothetically in a one game? Yes. But the issue that I have with the Warriors for the entire season is that they've been shitty in single game situations. We played the most clutch games of any team this season and mm -hmm. we're under 500. We've, we've played well in some respects, but our execution in those moments hasn't been great. And the fact that they have to win, not just one, but two, because currently they they are the 10th seed is not it. You want them to try to win out, and that's why tonight is such a, a, a big game because yeah. the Kings are actively sliding. So if they can keep winning, they can potentially move up maybe with L.A. and not be 9-10. I feel like it's a death sentence if you're 9-10 because even if you do win your two games, you not have to play two playoff caliber games with no rest headed into the first round. Mm -hmm. I don't want to see that. So, so, so like – I don't really believe in this team as much as a contender. They could make some noise. They could get out of the plan, but playing is single game elimination and they're owing to in that. Yeah, so, I get that. I do get that. I will I say, know. though, somebody's a perfect, per perfect, per perfect. Two row games as a 10 seed. 
and we're I, better on the road, which is crazy. And, but, and we are yeah. dangerous on the road. I will we say are. that. So yeah. I'm with gifted on the fact that I'm not looking at this as a warrior fan and saying the warriors are going to win it all. Now, if they were, to but win I'm not, it all, would I be surprised? Yeah. Slight, slight very actually, but you know, would it be something that I'd say the Warriors brand of basketball to win them another championship? Would I be surprised in that regard? Nah, because at the end of the day, Stephen A. Smith said it best on first take this morning. <laughs> he said, he yeah. said, he said the Warriors, if when you factor in the fact that they are a perimeter shooting threat, if you mean to tell me that they can't make at least um, like if you said, some noise. I'm sorry, yeah. guys. Um, I just got a call that there's some three extra Sixers tickets that, um, so I have to go to the Sixers game right now. But appreciate y'all. Y'all be easy. I'll see y'all on another day. Is it free Sixers tickets, did he say? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah free Sixers free. tickets, yeah. So oh, you got to go get those. Yeah, I gotta go, go ahead, bro. Those. So y'all be easy, man. Salute. You too. Um, and Jalen Green, I just want to say before I go, Jalen Green is back to his old ways. Yes, sir. And, you know, <laughs> he's <laughs> he's he's shooting with shooting slander is crazy. Yes, sir. Y'all be easy. All right, brother, man. All right, Gifted, it's me and you. That uh, is so funny. That is funny as shit. <laughs> it's funny as shit. Uh, but, yeah, so like like Stephen A. said on, on the show this morning, bro, like the Warriors in terms of a perimeter shooting threat and being able to click because he was like, you know what Steph Curry is going to bring you. They need either a combination of the two of the next best four players that they have in Clay, Kaminga, Wiggins, and Podzimski. If at least two of them show up consistently, then he thinks that the Warriors would be fine. I see that point. I do. And as it, I just talked to Jalen about this the last time I was on. It was two episodes ago. When we talk about the Bucks, for example, and bring it back to Milwaukee for a second. Think about Milwaukee's defensive woes, right? When they fired mm -hmm. Adrian Griffin, the reason they fired him was because, yeah, they were winning games and they were the second seed, but the defense was pretty mid, right? Hell, they bring in yeah. Doc Rivers. They bring in Doc Rivers. The defense gets, a, gets slightly better. The offense is still the same. They're still an up and down team. So I told Jalen, I was like, when I look at when when you think about something like defense, all it is is just effort. When we talked about the Warriors going into the season, gifted, what do we say? They need a big. They need a big. They need size. And we the probably Warriors, got Trace Jackson playing now. Exactly. Finally. They got Trace Jackson yeah. in the mix. Draymond's running the five for better or for worse. They're a top five rebounding team in the league, right? So when you look at that and you're like, they just give effort in certain spurts. I, that's why, I, as a Warriors fan, I'm not worried about them on the defensive end because I'm like, they just get effort. You can tell when the Warriors have it clicking to the point of like, offense is locked in, defense is locked in. So if if you were to ask me, do I think that they can make noise in the postseason? Yes, but do I think they're going to win the whole thing, go to the finals? Probably not. That'd be something that I think would be very, very surprising. And Steph Curry would probably be in my top five by the end of the season if that happened. We have to lock in crazy. That that shit is not. Mm -mm. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? I don't think we so, do it. I don't think we do it. Yeah, it's it's not something that I think is I, – so, I think it's something that we're capable of in terms of, you know, putting together a little run to make noise, but we still have – like, Denver is still there. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's, it's like Absolutely. it's like that wall is something that I just don't see us being able to break down without a solidified big, an Andrew Bogut presence, a Zaza Pachulia presence, like, like they used to have in the olden days of the greatest dynasty of the modern era or whatever. But – so, yeah, it's it's interesting. Let's let's transition though, since it's just us and and we're Warriors fans, and the title right. of the show is still among us. We haven't really dissected it. J Dub gave his two the cents. Houston Rockets, the man. The Houston Rockets, ladies and gentlemen. Y'all feel free to chime in on y'all's thoughts on if of, if Tory Eason destroyed the Rocket season or not, because the proof is in the goddamn pudding. I'm sorry, he did it. Tough. They ain't won a game since that infamous video. So the one thing I will say before I give it to you, get it, is this. The, the Houston Rockets are in a situation where you have a guy in Torrey Eason who, by no, is no scrub. Let me just start by saying that. Torrey Eason, I looked at him last year in certain spurts. I was like, yo, this guy's got some potential. I can see him being a real X factor for this team if they're looking to build upon the young guys that they got. You know what I'm saying? Give him his flowers. Pretty solid, right? Nothing spectacular, but a pretty solid piece to a young core and, and rising Celtics team. I mean, <laughs> Celtics, Rockets team. But it's always the players that ain't the franchise players that fuck it up. Or excuse my language. <laughs> that, just, that just mess it up for a team that's on the rise. 
I think to now there's a slight example in the Memphis Grizzlies with John Morant saying we find in the West, but you know, then you get to the Dylan Brooks's of, of the world that say, you know, I ain't gonna respect nobody till they give me 40. And then the Lakers beat them by 40. And it's like, yo, stop yep. and we ain't got nothing to show for it. The Rockets are a team that are was talking from outside of the club. They weren't even in the play in, bro. They're peeking up, they're peeking in, they window shopping or whatever, they see it. But it's like you got to get there before you can say something like that. And then you end up playing the Warriors a week and a half later. You know they not going for that, bro. Clay owns your franchise or has owned it for the last two years since he came back from injury in terms of yep. individual performances. And Steph owns it all time. So, like, why, why are you, Tori Eason, not Jalen Green, right, not Alperin, like, not, you know, like, not even Dylan Brooks, bro. Like, why are you starting this shit? And then they go out there and they get handled. So, do I think this Rockets team is going to be great next year? I think they're going to be better than they were this year for sure. This is something they can build upon. Absolutely. But stop talking, bro, when you're not even – when you're almost up. Like, bro. Go ahead, Gifted. Yeah, I would say that – Um, how would I say this? Okay. I don't have an issue with what Tar Eason did because young players are going to talk their shit. He's young. He hasn't really had that much time in the NBA and he's confident in his team. So I love him standing on business for his team, but ultimately he's not playing basketball Mm -hmm. and they did poke the bear of the go to state warriors. Again, they've been super uh, inconsistent this season, but if there's one thing that I know I can rely on the warriors to do, no matter how bad of a team they are, it's beat the Houston Rockets. And the reason why I say that (laughs) is the last time that that the Rockets beat the Warriors was 2019, pre-COVID. That is the Mm -hmm. last time that they actually beat the Golden State Warriors. Every time they play the Warriors, they take it personal. If Steph is maybe not all the way healthy, he's going to play to make sure that he gets a chance to to really, like, crash out versus them. Clay Thompson, again, had a vintage game during our recent stretch. Clay has been playing some of his best basketball of the season at the right time. And Trey Jackson Davis, as you said, is finally getting minutes. He's no longer a DNP. Corey Joseph finally isn't playing over him. So they were able to beat the Rockets. But it's kind of sad how, like, this team went from, oh, yeah, like, this year is going to be different. This year, like, this year is not going to be the stand. Like, this year is these is the standard last year was the anomaly and they're basically worse than they were last year. No. Yeah. They, they actually are worse than they were last year. And it's like, we're spending time talking about, Oh yeah, we beat the Rockets. We ended their season. Cool. The Rockets should have never even come that close to the Warriors where it's even a conversation where it comes down to a game that matters. Oh yeah, we beat the Rockets. But to me, that more speaks so of how shit go to say has been as a team for the majority of the season. And now it's like, all right, well, we watch the games and we see them play good basketball here or there, here or there. But the execution has just been so disappointing for the Warriors the entire season. They mm-hmm. put their best stretch of basketball forth now, which is good because this is the time where it matters the most. So it's time to see if we can flip a, a script, if Steve Kerr is finally comfortable with these rotations, if we're able to see things. But it's kind of tough because literally – Pods, who was a very good, you know, ball player at the beginning of the season. Now his ass don't want to shoot. He's literally Ben Simmons, where every time he catch the ball, it's close out, kick, close out, kick, close out, kick. Like there's there's a lot of flaws with this team, but they're in position to do something. What yeah. that something is, I don't know. I don't believe it's a championship. Honestly, I feel like they're gonna get smoked by a couple teams in the playoffs if they make it that far. But they have a chance, and I'm not going to rule them out based on that chance. I'll say that much. But big shout out to the Rockets. Um, mainly, this felt good because a lot of Rockets fans were talking shit like they weren't struggling for position. And I heard some Rockets fans say, "Listen, I know Shingun isn't playing, but based on how Jalen Green's been playing, yep. we get downhill more. We got more wings now, so it's like mm-hmm. when he's not playing, our, our defense is better. Like this is a different look for the Warriors." And then we blew them out by like 30 damn near. So, yeah. I mean, I was happy and to see was, that. The the one thing that Gifted said throughout that whole entire spill that that I agree with to the T is I know for a fact that when the chips are down, 
and the Warriors have to go out there and beat somebody ass, it's the Houston Rockets. Every yeah, time. Do that. And the crazy part is, is that last year, right, when Steph was missing uh, stretches of the season and the and the Warriors would match up with the Rockets, Clay had two 40-point games back-to-back on them niggas, bro. Like, it, it's, it is inevitable it that, that the Warriors are going to win and somebody on that squad is going to go off. But it is what it is. Um, so, yeah, when you think back to teams like – that are young and on the rise. This makes me want to talk about the Grizzlies a little bit because they were in a situation where I thought was very unique, where you looked at them at one point and you were like, I see the potential. I see what you're building. I see what you're doing, right? Mm -hmm. Dylan Brooks, Ja, why don't I start with Dylan Brooks, of course. Dylan the villain, Ja, Desmond Bain, Jaron Jackson, Steven Adams, right? Xavier Tillman off the bench, uh, Tyus Jones at one point. Like you saw the vision. And you were like, okay, the Grizzlies have always been known for grit and grind off grit and grind basketball play, right? Yeah. Now you're trying to get into this era of we're getting behind John Morant. We're gonna be high and fly and be gritty and grind and all that stuff, right? We're gonna do our thing. And then John said comes out and says, I'm fine in the West with that sneaky ass smile. And I'm sitting here saying, Hey, bro, look, y'all are good. At the time, I remember I was like, Y'all are good. Like, I think they were the second seed in the West at that point. But I was like, Y'all still don't have a match for Denver. Y'all still don't have a match for Golden State. You still don't fear me in that regard. Um, yeah, you can catch us slacking a couple times, which they did in the series at one point. But I was like, y'all are not at a level where you can legitimately say that the Grizzlies are competing for a chip. You can say that they're competing to, for the playoffs. That's great. High seed, cool. But you knew that they were a few pieces away from actually solidifying a championship contending roster. So to talk that much stuff and call yourself a dynasty and all of that – like yo chill the greatest teams the greatest dynasties never called themselves a dynasty before they won their first chip it's sure you know what i'm saying so sure. like you said though i have no issue with tory eason you know being a young nba player he's gonna ride for his team that's great he's standing on business but you gotta watch who you standing on business on because the warriors was gonna stand all over their business and they business because bruh we own y'all. Like, don't don't get it confused. Like, that's like that's like Justin Fields calling out Aaron Rodgers and the Packers when he was back when he was still there. Like, I own your franchise. Stop talking. You're gonna put more pressure on yourself. <laughs> you're gonna start sweating and shit. Now you nervous and I'm up 15. Like, it don't <laughs> you you did this. Like, what do you what do you mean? So at, from that moment on, you remember we was on an episode, me and you, and and Mars came in the chat and was talking mad shit before now. Mars was morning. chatting. Mars, Mars was definitely chatting. chatting about that, yeah, for sure. Chat, chatting up a storm, fully confident. He was behind Tory Easton too. He was doing his thing, you know, no doubt. But like, no, bro, like, we ain't here for none of that. So get that up out of here. I do want to transition. Yeah, I'm glad that I'm glad that we got that we were able to talk about this. I want to transition into MVP talks because mm. taking a look at the standings right now. All right, Minnesota one seed, Denver two seed. Three seed OKC, four seed Clippers, fifth seed. They Mavs. still fight for that one seed up top, man. It's crazy. They are. And when I look at it, like, look, I told y'all before, my MVP would be SGA if and only if Oklahoma City is able to come away with the one seed. Now I'm starting to look at that and be like, look, I remember saying years ago, Luca could be my could be MVP on any given season if he's the right seeding, if he has the right seeding. Looking at it right now, the Mavericks got a shot. You know what I'm saying? They got a shot to take that four seed, and then it might not be – it might be, oh, okay, Luca's averaging 34, what and what? Yeah, exactly. So, I don't know. The MVP I, – I know it's only in the Western Conference, though, is where the MVPs are really actually at. But, yep. you know, I don't know. I think that if Luca ends up with that four seed, he might – they might give it to him. They might. But if, if Jokic and the Nuggets end up with that one seed, I could see Jokic walking away with it again, more than likely. It's, I, it's all about the seeding. It's really all about the seeding for me. I think the answer is Jokic, and I think it's because it's it's all about the seeding. They consistently have been in the fight for the one seed the entire season. Yep. And more than anything, I mean, Denver has been rounding in the form. Um, a lot of people will talk about um, how bad Lucas' team around him is outside of Kyrie. And whatnot, but then in the same breath, they'll say that, that this is the best team that they put around Luca. I kind of feel like it, if you keep it a spade of a spade, it has to be somewhere in between that. And for a while now, Jamal Murray hasn't been healthy 
for Denver, and Jokic yep. just had to carry that load, and he's done it. I mean, like, they've been beating a bunch of teams without their second-best player, which they still need Jamal to go all the way and win the title. But with his stats, with where the team is, and, again, just how dominant he's been as a player, with Shea also missing time, mm-hmm. um, I still feel like the MVP is going to probably go to Jokic. I think Shea had a much more competitive case a couple games back, but now that they're trying to get you know prepared for the playoffs and he's not playing – as many games, um, even though he still had a very dominant MVP caliber season, yep. Jokic to me is the answer and should be the MVP. I'm confident in saying that now. And I will say to your point, Nicole Jokic has played 75 games. So 75 games. Like, like, like let's like, just keep that in mind. How many mm-hmm. games are left to play? He's played 75 games. That's insane. And and that is something that I feel goes completely under the radar anytime people are discussing Jokic and MVP cases, the both durability, and that's the differentiating factor between him and his biggest contemporary in Joel Embiid, which is injuries and health and actually being there to dominate or dominating on a consistent level or being healthy on a consistent level. Nikola Jokic yep. has played 75 games this year. So to Sharky, uh, why we talk about Jamal Murray, dude? It's a it's very important. When Jokic won his first MVP, who wasn't there for the major- for the majority of the season? Jamal Murray and Michael Porter Jr. He walked into the guys. playoffs yep. with a team. He walked into the playoffs with a team where he was the only guy on the team averaging above maybe sixteen a game. That was and a bad team. Fact bro. over twenty. So yeah. this is the guy that has had the whole, and he got him to the sixty. So I feel you on that when you're talking about Luka Doncic and his injuries. I do. But the the MVP voters, bro, I feel like they're not gonna they're not gonna feel like that, Sharky. They just they just not. They just gonna be like, look, seventy five games of this, seventy five games of this. The durability is <coughs> is no question. So, and listen, I want to be fair. I think Luca absolutely is the MVP candidate. I think he yeah. absolutely has an argument to win over Jokic. I just feel like. When you bring up the games play and also just how good of a player Jokic has been the entire season, I think that's going to give him the slight edge. Even though to me, Luka in a vacuum has been better than Jokic in terms of his his production for his cast. I think the consistency and the durability is a big part of why Jokic is going to win his MVPs because every MVP he's had, he's played all the games. He's been there night after night after night. And more importantly, the on-off when he's on the floor and not is like top two in the league. He's that good of a player. So I think he's going to win it, man. I truly, when truly you talk do. About, another thing, too, when you talk about most valuable player to not just MVP in and of itself, but most valuable player to their team, that's where the MVP argument gets a little bit skewed because you look at the – you look at, like, I always say this. If you take Jason Tatum off of the Boston Celtics, are they still a number one seed in the Eastern Conference, do you think, or at least top three seed? Think about it. You have Jalen Brown, who is going to be – he's still going to give you two-way play with more shots. Derek White and Drew Holiday in the backcourt still. Kristaps Porzingis, like I – mean, you might have a weak bench to an extent. I could see people say who say that. But a solid coach in Joe Missoula with a solid defensive scheme and all of that, Jalen Brown is just going to be getting more shots. I think that, that that team is still going to be at the top of the conference. Nikola Jokic and his value to his team? Yeah, it seems no oh, no, you and and, and yeah, no. to, to, to Sharky's credit, Luka Doncic and his value to his team, right? Steph Curry and his value to his team, right? There's certain players where you're just like, yo, you can make arguments about value all you want and, and all that, but you know, that's where you have to factor in seeding, consistency, durability, and all the other intangibles to make up the MVP award and how it's going to be presented to most likely Nikola Jokic this year. Like, yeah, it's tough. Um, I would agree, but yeah. Um, let's see. We got anything else? You got you got any hot topics you've seen recently? Hot debates? Yeah. Hot debates? Um, I got something hot. Uh, I do want to focus on Wemby because we talked about him last last EP. Um, right. the logo. What are your thoughts on his logo? I like it. Uh, I think that like it 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 suits him. I'll say, you know, I get the whole alien concept and things of that nature. Um, 
but it kind of it kind of looks like an octopus. I'm looking at it right now, like <laughs> without all the tentacles, but like a little. That like, should look hard. Like, but yeah, it's it's it's, it's it it fits them. I can see it. It's the alien. It's the alien in the middle with the with the with the like mini ships around it, and then you yeah. got like the two Nikes. But it's all curved in a basketball spear like that. Yeah, that shit's hard to me, bro. They gonna might, be able to market that crazy. Best, he might have the best logo in the game right now. Somebody said better than Braun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, that's crazy but yeah i like it it fits his it fits him it fits his character and his whole persona yeah. and everything like that so yeah for sure hey next 10 years i mean people said it was gonna be luca that was gonna take over but how are you gonna do that and his logo ain't even better than I, I, I literally <laughs> cannot wait to see what 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 he looks like next year because next year he probably won't be on a, a minutes restriction he might yeah. be able to come out the gate and play 30 minutes a game like he he could really put together like an all NBA caliber season next year. I think this year, a big part of why he's not in that combo is because at the beginning of the season, he had severe minute restrictions, but also, you know, the team wasn't as good. I do think the Spurs are, are going to probably be slightly better next year. But if he's able to play from start to finish 30 plus minutes a game, it's going to be hard to tell me he's not all NBA. He's going to be very, very good. Now, I get you, Sharky, right? Big men don't sell shoes. I hear that. But the difference is we see anomalies all the time. Wemby could be that specific anomaly because he's already box office. He's a great player. And what he's been hyped up to be is this alien type of guy that you don't expect. This seven foot five guy who actually has charisma is marketable. I can see it. I really could see it. Yeah. I mean, I ain't gonna lie. It's a tough ass logo, I will say. Um, so let's see let's see any you got any more hot takes i'm looking through my list right now of topics and we're we're about to be out honestly <laughs> we got one yeah. more left. yeah the the uh only other thing uh, um i would say is i wanted to get your thoughts on if you okay if the sixers match up with the bucks realistically mm-hmm. in a playoff scenario right what do you think is the biggest factor to them actually being able to win in that series? The Sixers? What is the yes? What do they have to do specifically to match up and defeat the Bucks in the playoffs consistently, like all the way through the round? Uh I would say number one thing is Joel Embiid has to be healthy. That's it. I don't even care about because, in my honest opinion. The consistency for Joel and B, like we players struggle with consistency. Some players do, right? Clay Thompson, uh, Jordan Poole, whatever. Yeah. In Joel and B's case, it's different. His inconsistencies specifically come from health because we've seen what he can do at 100%, right? For the majority of a regular season, not the majority, but for regular season stretches only. Most of the time in the postseason, we've seen him hurt. And there have been some instances where he has been healthy or at least relatively healthy and still sold the bag. But I'm going to give him a little bit of the benefit of the doubt. If Joel Embiid is healthy, he is their engine on offense and their number one engine on defense. Because in the interior, that's where the players are going to end up if they get past, you know, Kelly Oubre or Tobias Harris or whatever. Joel Embiid is the engine of both offense and defense. So that's the number one thing. The number two, okay. The number two thing would be Tyrese Maxey's production, not just Tyrese Maxey, though. Kelly Oubre is somebody that I think can fly under the radar in a potential playoff series because, look, Tobias Harris, let's be real. The lyric. He's, he's not good. I'm sorry. The lyric I'm of down fourth, to quarter, fourth quarter, why the fuck Batuman should now be, why is Tobias Harris said? Like, yeah. I, like, and don't get me wrong, Tobias Harris is one of the biggest wasted contracts in Philadelphia 76er history. Like, let me, like, like let's just be real. Um, for the player that, that he is to be paid that much, eh, not necessarily see, I'm not really seeing the, the vision there, but that's why I think a player like Kelly Oubre, if he comes out there and he's consistent, at least in terms of shooting the ball, because you got to think Joel Embiid is the type of player that's going to draw defensive attention. So the way that he's been kicking out to three point shooters this season, before he had gotten hurt, I was like, this is all I, this is what I've been dreaming you for you to do Joel Embiid. Just a little bit of playmaking, just a little bit of basketball IQ, reading the double team, knowing you're the biggest dude on the court and kicking it out to able shooters. Yes, bro. So that's the second thing is there's only two things. Joel Embiid staying healthy, 
and his two and his role players stepping up. Role players, I use that term lightly, but I'm mainly talking about Tyrese Maxey and Kelly Oubre Jr., who I think, if this situation were to happen, would uh-huh. probably step up next to a healthy Joel Embiid. I I could see it. Um, so that'd be me. But what about you? Okay, so where I'm at with it is I think the biggest egg factors for the Sixers are how they close out ball games, specifically having another ball handler besides Tyrese Maxey. I think Tyrese is a very good player, but I think in the playoffs when the defense really starts to key in on you, they need to have another guy who can reliably manage the ball beyond Tyrese Maxey. Yeah. And I feel like the, their biggest issue as well is Tobias Harris continues to regress as a player. His defense is horrific. He's very bad. Like, like his all-ball defense isn't good. And they don't really have another consistent score beyond Joel Embiid and Tyrese Maxey that really puts fear in you. Like, like, okay, boom, right? If you if it's you, right? Who's their closing five in the playoffs for the Philadelphia 76ers? Right? Like yeah. <laughs> we're saying Kelly Oubre might be our next best option after those two. That's why to me, like their ceiling's kind of low, even if Joel Embiid comes back, because they don't have a reliable third option type of guy and they still don't have like a true three and D wing that can play defense and shoot yeah. and they got injuries. I'm pretty sure Melton isn't going to be coming back yeah. either, which hurts them because he was a very good player for them. And I will say this too, to your point about um, the team and, and just the reliability aspect outside of a maybe healthy Joel and B, maybe not, we don't know. Um, I will say this when you're talking about them versus the Milwaukee Bucks, a team that their defense, they have trouble keeping people in front of them in general, as a whole. We just mentioned how their how their backcourt is Damian Lillard and Malik Beasley for the majority of the of the time. And that defense ain't gonna get you nothing, right? So you but in the on the interior is something that a healthy Joel and B drawing that much attention, or mm-hmm. just the fact that you have a Tyrese Maxey who's fast as hell. So in terms of one-on-one matchups, he could get past anybody on the bucks on the perimeter between their one and two guard. So yeah. setting things up and all it's all about the it's going to be about the execution. And on top of the fact that I believe that if you have Nick nurse out in a coaching battle with doc rivers, I see Nick nurse winning that like, sorry, you know, um, I, I mean, do you believe in Lowry as their backup? Here's the thing with Lowry. Uh-huh. Production for a player like a Kyle Lowry, who's what, like 38? <laughs> like, like He's old as hell. For, yeah. for a player like Kyle Lowry and, and the role on this team, that was that was what I was trying to figure out at the trade deadline when he got traded. It's like, what the hell is Philly going to use him for? Right? So now we're thinking, hopefully, if Joel Embiid's healthy, Lowry's going to be that presence on the court. Because when you think about Lowry from a basketball IQ perspective – He's one of the he's one of the smart smartest vets in the league in terms of being able to read the referee, make the be in the right position to get the right call, uh, swipe downs when people are driving into the lane, like just making all the right plays and, like Baller said, manage the game. That's 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 what I was getting at. Kyle Lowry is a game manager. Now, in a playoff run, a thirty eight year old Kyle Lowry coming off the bench. I feel like he's gonna, depending on who messes up in the starting lineup, that's gonna be where he, where his like play style or play time is. But like in terms of helping the team from that perspective of just being not not necessarily an X factor, but a vet factor, that's the yeah. only that's the only thing I see him being on the floor for. You feel me? Like not necessarily too much production, but production in little areas where you know nobody else really wants. Like Kyle Lowry's gonna be the type of player that's gonna dive on the floor for a loose ball at his age still. Right, just being uh, being that energy like sifter for the team, game manager, if you will. But that's the role he's gonna have for me. I feel like game manager for Lowry, ideally, you think makes sense, mm-hmm. and I think he can still provide value in that role slightly. But my biggest problem is offensively, he's he's completely lost it. I mean, yeah, teams don't respect his shooting anymore. He doesn't get downhill. He's not like a net offensive positive by just being out there anymore. And I feel like if the ball's not in his hands, really, what is he doing on the floor? 
True. And I would argue that, like, okay, sure, like, you have him doing that. But Tyrese and Embiid are, are going to play the bulk of the minutes. To me, you really need to get more value from a player like Buddy Hill. I think Buddy Hill needs to be the, the guy that when they stagger and they have Tyrese Maxey on the bench, now, don't worry, we still have our two-man game, but, but now we have Embiid running it with Buddy Heald, who as good as Tyrese Max is as a shooter, Buddy Heald is the better shooter, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So to me, like, that would give them a lot of versatility and another way to attack opposing defenses. With the Bucks specifically, though, the Bucks have more size, I think, than the Sixers do. do. Mm -hmm. I feel that way. But I also feel like because their backcourt is so exploitable, that's the series where where – we need to see Tyrese Maxey rise to that star level. Cause I don't yeah. think that their coverages are going to be that effective. He's very, very fast. Um, he can really torch them in transition pretty quickly. So that execution can help them a lot. We got to see it though. Like I'm, I'm not sure how that really works out for them on paper. Cause again, if Kelly Oubre is your best wing offensively, that's very concerning to me, bro. It's a it's a concern um, because what you have in a player like a Kelly Oubre, who honestly, if we think about it, is in a tier of like the like D'Angelo Russell, it's like you know, where it's like yeah. you. It can be a detriment to your team if you have them on the floor, but that's only if they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing, you know, while they're on the floor. For D'Lo in his role, when LeBron is there specifically, you basically got to be catch and shoot. Or yeah. LeBron has yeah. got to be able to give you the ball in certain spots to get off a shot, right? But Austin Reeves gets that shit too. So it's like and he's probably going to get more opportunities to do that than you are. So you need to hit your shots, you know? With Kelly Oubre, it's the same exact thing. Buddy Heald, like you said, they insert in a Buddy Heald into the mix. I like what Logical Raptors, Raptors fanatic said right here. He needs needs assisted buckets in his opinion. Absolutely, I 100 yeah. percent agree with that. Where he gets those assisted buckets will come from Joel Embiid's decision making when getting double teamed in the post. That yep. is 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 essentially, and when you have a guy like Buddy Heald out there on a perimeter, I'd be more comfortable in Buddy Heald taking those threes than Kelly Oubre. Not to say Kelly Oubre is a scrub. But I'd be more comfortable with Buddy Hill shooting it because I know Buddy Hill is known for being relatively a good three-point marksman, right? He's been able yeah, to shoot sure. that thing consistently. Kelly Oubre has had moments where you'll say, okay, for you know a month stretch, Kelly Oubre has been shooting lights out from corner threes. But then he'll go and, and miss some shots here and there or make some boneheaded decisions, right? Um, and you're just like, uh, damn. Buddy Hill isn't really going to make too many boneheaded decisions, right? <laughs> Buddy Hill, Buddy Hill is a guy that knows his role and plays it accordingly. And if you have a Joel Embiid that's doing his role and kicking it out to him, that can be a dangerous concept. Tyrese Maxey, like you said, gifted, needs to exploit the weak defense in front of him. That's something that's going to be harder to do if they were to say beat the Bucks and then go into a series where they're going up against the Boston Celtics. That's going to be tougher to do. Yeah. But for Maxey to get the most, to be, for Maxey to be able to maximize his you know, potential in a playoff series, you got to do it against a Damian Lillard and Malik Beasley backcourt. <laughs> like you got, yep. you got to, you got to be able to at least be, you know, a solidified Robin. You know, and you when they dig, when they dig specifically on Maxi, when he's operating as a ball right. handler in the pick and rolls, his decision making has to be more than just I'm going to burst overall exactly. to the basket. His deceleration, the passes he throws out of that, are really going to be the true test for how much he's grown as a player. Yeah, that's what we're waiting on, honestly, that's, to see. That's something that I, I even alluded to a few episodes ago when we were talking about Jalen Green, when he was going on that little run, and I was like, the one thing that he's doing that I really wish that he was doing earlier or earlier on two seasons ago was uh, when he attacks downhill, his decision-making on that, because you can have a situation where – you know, you take an explosive player like a Jalen Green or a John Morant and they're attacking downhill and you understand the thought of them wanting to punch it. But John Morant, what separates him from Jalen Green and his recklessness when he does that is John Morant, when he's making a pass, his passes are a lot more accurate than Jalen Green passing out of a drive downhill up in the air about to punch it. Right. So true. when I look at Tyrese Maxey, the one the biggest pro that Tyrese Maxey has is his quickness. Right. His ability to explode downhill, his ability to go out in a fast break transition and score buckets. So his decision making going downhill is something that if you can elevate that by 
playmaking, obviously, playmaking out of you know certain situations or spots that you see, that's something that could help a team tremendously in a playoff series. And it can help your case of us looking at you not just as a really good player, but damn, you you might be you might be on to something. You might be the next one up. We see why yeah. they're developing you, right, in Philly. You feel me? So it's all about Tyrese Maxey, like the gift they're looking to, just playing the right way, right? Um, so I'm I, that was a good discussion. I ain't gonna lie. Uh, gotta see it, chat, man. I am excited chat. to see him. Hit the like button, chat. Uh, drop your thoughts in the comments below. Sixers versus Bucks hypothetical playoff series. Healthy Joel and B. Who do you got? Who do you got? Be real, be effing for real. Um, as I look at the standings, though, as we're approaching the near end of the show, I might end it a little yeah. bit early. I'm not gonna lie because we're down to the last topic. <laughs> so, uh, in terms of the in terms of the standings. How do you feel about the West versus the Eastern Conference in terms of how people have always viewed the Western Conference? Like, like how long has the West really been running the league in terms of competition, close seating, all of that, just the best teams, right? I want to get your thoughts on that. Okay. It's been a while, honestly. I feel like the West has really held down the best teams overall for quite some time. And I feel like the main reason behind it is – the Eastern Conference teams, they're like these more physical teams that are more grit and grind, I guess. But the West just has way more offensive talent. I feel like there was a moment where you might have said, OK, the pendulum might swing when Kawhi went went over to yep. the Eastern Conference. But now that everyone's back West, it's like it's so hard. Like, dude, even when we got drafted in the Western Conference, right? Yep. Like even the future after these star players age. The young talent is all in the West. Wemby, Scoop, maybe, Anthony uh, Edwards, Jalen Green. All these players reside in the Western Conference. In the East, there's not that many, you know, teams to talk about. Shoot, even Trey Young, who's in the East, might get traded to the West. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, 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 like, that's what we're seeing. And also, more than, uh, more than anything, the elite of the elite players in terms of like the top five, they they are pretty much all in the Western Conference outside of Giannis and maybe Joel Embiid, right? Those mm -hmm. two guys are in the East, but LeBron, Steph, KD, Jokic, Luka, okay. all of these guys are in the Western Conference. I think that's what aids it to being the best conference. And you also got to think about it, right? Look at the – sorry. Look at the seating in the Western Conference, mm -hmm. Right. The 10 seed Warriors are how many games above 500? Uh, eight. Okay, perfect. Now go to the East and go look at their 10 seed, which might be the Bulls, I think. Yep. No, it's the Hawks. It's the Hawks. Hawks. What's their record? 36 and 42. Like, you see what I'm saying? Like, like the Hawks are <laughs> under 500. The Warriors are several games over 500. And the difference is that the Warriors play more West teams than, than they do in the East. That's yeah. how fickle the Eastern Conference is. And that's why the competition has always, you know, separated itself in the Western Conference. Because you could right, reasonably take teams out of the Western Conference, put them in the East, and they're in the top five like that. Yeah, pretty easily. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. that to me strikes a, a very drastic difference. What do you think, though? I think like the fact that like I want to see, for example, if if the when the plan yeah. when the plan starts, I want to get I want to find out what the viewership numbers are for the East playing teams versus the West playing teams. That'll tell you your story right there in terms of conferences, <laughs> in terms of conferences and, 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 and superiority or whatever. But like like think about it. Which game would you rather see, ladies and gentlemen? Chat, you can get in on this too. Mm -hmm. which, which which nine and ten seed game would you want to see? The Chicago Bulls and the Hawks or the Warriors and the Lakers? Warriors, Lakers. But <laughs> but to be fair, Bulls, Hawks is funny because we don't know who wants to lose more in that right. matchup. Right. I will say that. It's, and b b there you go. That's another thing you can throw at it, at the wall. It's just like yo, like the 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 difference in mindsets of nine and ten seeds in each conference, right? Like like it like the Heat and the Sixers. I'm not gonna lie, that'll be a good game. The Kings and the and the Pelicans, that would be a good game. But when you look at the conference as a whole, it's just like like you said, the last time that I think that the East really was looking like okay, they might be competing was when Kyrie and and Harden and KD was on Brooklyn. And Hart and or or when Kyrie and KD was there, and then Harden was in uh, Philadelphia with Joel. 
that was when I was like, okay, maybe the East is about to make a little run at, you know, maybe catching up to the Western Conference in terms of viewership and marketability or whatever you want to call it. Like, so the way I see it is I agree with you on the part of like, the East is all about grit and defense. And it's a whole different feel mm-hmm. of play when you watch the games, right? Like, think back 10 years ago. We can go 10 years ago or damn near. When the Warriors were first winning games, right, in the Western Conference, you had teams like the Warriors, teams like the Spurs, the Clippers with Chris Paul and at the tail end. We had 50-plus win teams not, yeah. not making the playoffs back then, bro. Yes, bro. And then you look at the East and you knew what was going to happen every single time. LeBron's going to the finals. How many games did the Hawks win this year? You said 60. Fuck that. LeBron's going to the finals, bro. Like, yep. that, like it was it. But in the West, you're like, okay. I don't know. You you just don't. And that's the same thing that you feel with the Western Conference this year compared to the Eastern Conference. It's like, yo, 10 years later, it's the same story. The Celtics are probably going to go there, but there is a little bit of doubt. There is, right? But there is no thought process or no concrete answer that you could give me besides maybe if you just want to just say Denver and forget about it. But you don't know who's coming out of the West. Be real. Like, to be completely you honest, you don't know. Like it's not, it's not like I lean, I lean Denver, obviously, but like right. the teams that are competing to win basketball games in the West, there's legitimately 10 playoff caliber teams. We, we didn't know what the plan was going to be until a couple days ago. We exactly. just clinched playing positioning, but literally the Houston Rockets were a couple games from making the interest in, and maybe making the plan. That's and, and by the way, we're saying all of this, right? Keep in mind. Memphis comes back next year fully healthy. Yep. Rockets are going to get better, right? Jazz are going to probably still be a bottom feeder, but what if they trailer market into another Western Conference team? Like the these are things we got to think about. The conference is only going to get harder as these younger teams get better. Yeah, so. and then you got to think about the 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 trajectory. What are you trusting more in the next like 5 years? The Pistons getting better or or investing in that or the Spurs and what they're going to invest in when Binyama to maximize God, pay for the Pistons man pay, pay, pay for, for the Pistons, Pistons. Holy even shit, though man. even though I think I think the Pistons could 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 feel figure out something could have a situation where they're the right pieces are there and they start making a little bit of noise and they start figuring out okay who exactly are we really going to build around and they can make some noise like the Orlando Magic are the third seed right now right give Pablo Bancaro some love like yeah it's it's but but like the Eastern Conference, when you think about trajectory and all that, like get this at the Atlanta Hawks, right? Their franchise player is Trey Young. They're about to trade him to a Western Conference team at probably. Most right? likely. And if it ain't gonna be him, it's gonna be DeJounte Murray back in this Western Conference. Like there is it's yeah, it's nah. This is raps over there. But great show. I think this is about a good time to wrap it up. We're about 10 minutes early, but it doesn't matter. My throat is is dry. I need water, bro. Paul I feel you on that. Um no diddy, no diddy, no diddy. But you were such a no diddy merchant, by the way. I am, and I love every second of it. <laughs> you uh, love every second of diddy. I love every second of no diddy. The, the giddy, okay, <laughs> get, get, get it, get it straight. Get it. You try to set me up, gifted. That's crazy. That's crazy. Hey, look, gifted. Anyway, uh, we still can't like, <laughs> still can't let Dub get away with what he said way back when about Drake. But whatever. And now Dub crashed out. Yeah, he crashed out hard. He crashed out so hard. But uh, anyway. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in. Uh, you saw three of us at least today, so that's great. This is episode 11, maybe. I think this is episode 13, actually. 13? Yeah, episode 13. Um, from the logo coming at you every Tuesday, every Thursday, and every Sunday. Tuesday is Thursday mm-hmm. at 6 p.m. Sunday is at 1 p.m. I am your host for every Tuesday, the GOAT ZZ Huncho, alongside Gifted mm-hmm. Hoops. Talk to the people. Let them know where to find you. And go ahead and end us off, brother. Absolutely. Uh, make sure to tap into our show. Again, our show times are below here. Pretty soon we'll be having live playoff games to, to talk about and dissect. Yeah. We're very, very close to that. So appreciate y'all support and whatnot. Um, you can find me on Twitter, Twitch, and YouTube. Uh, Gift the Hoops, Gift the Hoops underscore on Twitter. On YouTube, it's just Gifted Hoops. And uh, yeah, man, can't wait for basketball. Definitely keep tapping in with us. It's going to be some great conversations coming forward and hopefully we can stop low managing as a you know roster for our show but we get in there you know things we happen but as we push forward this t- towards this playoff push this year it's gonna be lit so tap yeah, in y'all sure. <laughs> all right y'all i'll see y'all thursday we'll see you thursday
This has been from the logo. Peace out, people. Have a good one. Watch basketball, please. Please watch Go basketball. Warriors. We got some crazy games coming up. Go Warriors. Y'all know. Go Warriors. What do you say?